what we're using is a process that says where you are, the measured values of the current mean, the current SD based on fact, compared to where you want to be, the measured peer mean, and the medical opinion of the medical goal and acceptable risk level. With those numbers, you can mathematically calculate the percent of results that are currently not where you want to be. You can calculate the number of SD that you can shift from where you are now until you're no longer where you want to be. Or you can do what's currently recommended today and you can calculate a sigma metric. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but this formula is mathematically incorrect. You are coming to a point where you're going to have to choose how you're going to measure risk. There are at least four ways that I know of to calculate sigma. There is only one way to calculate margin for error, and there really is only one truth. If you have a method with a peer mean of 100, a current mean of 110, a current SD of 10, I took my medical goal out to 40, the bias is 10, the total error is 10, and sure enough, the total error as a percent is 30%. But if you calculate bias and standard D and CV and add them up, you don't get 30%. And if this method really did have a CV of 10% and a bias of 10%, then it would have a total error of 32%, not 30. If the bias is low, the opposite happens. You're, you're going to estimate the total error at 30% when it's actually 32 or you'll estimate it at 28% when it's actually 30. If we take the numbers to calculate margin for error and sigma, so sigma is simply your margin for error plus 2. The margin for error is how far you can shift until your risk becomes unacceptable. Sigma is the number of standard deviations between the mean and the total allowable error limit. By the time you reach zero sigma, for the 8% of, of you who said that was okay, you have 50% failure. Um, watch it. I'll take that up to 110. The number of patients at risk is 50%. The margin for error is minus 2, but let's calculate sigma. If you calculate sigma from the percents, in this case, you're going to get a sigma value of zero, same as we got. With a sigma value of zero, there's a 50% error rate. Let's bring this back to something a little more reasonable, or maybe, whoops, up in the realm of 105. If the mean is 105, if I choose to calculate margin for error and transfer that to percent and transfer that percent to the number of medically unreliable results in a month, I get 187. If you calculate sigma from percents, if you, if you transfer this to percents and then calculate your sigma, you'll think there's only 130 people at risk. We asked about long-term and short-term sigma. Six Sigma comes with a built-in assumption of a shift of minus 1.5 Sigma to long-term. We're back to a new recording to see if we can add a little bit of clarity or a little more confusion to the idea of Six Sigma. And I do apologize for speaking badly about Six Sigma. I know it is near and dear to the hearts of many of you, but please hear me out. I think there's things that we're missing and I'm just not sure that this industrial process belongs in the medical lab. Consider this. When we voted, they went anywhere from 8% said zero sigma was acceptable and 28% said no, it's got to be all the way up at six sigma. Had I phrased that question differently, I think the answers would have been very different. If you translate the sigma values into the number of medically unreliable results, you find that what we just voted for here 
was acceptable risk of medically unreliable results somewhere in between one in two and one in a billion. How many bad results are you willing to report? And if you're using the sigma metric, this is in essence what you were saying. A sigma of, of zero is a 50% failure rate. A sigma of six is one in a billion. A sigma of three, two, wherever you set that sigma determines the percent of results that will fail, that you'll allow to fail, and the number of medically unreliable results. So for those of you who said, I would accept a sigma of zero, what you're really saying is I would accept one in two results being medically unreliable. However, if you said I want a sigma of six, then you want it to be one in a billion. You may not be able to attain that goal. And then we added the complication of was it a short-term sigma, a long-term sigma, or what is the difference? And this is why I say six sigma I don't think works the way it is in medical labs. Here's the real kicker about six sigma. Most people don't even know there's a difference between short-term sigma and long-term sigma. And yet, part and parcel of the Six Sigma concept is a difference between short and long-term sigma of 1.5 SDs, 1.5 S. So the fundamental assumptions of Six Sigma are unknown or unclear to most people in the lab. We had almost 100 people vote on that. If you calculate risk using the measured values, you get a different number than if you were to calculate sigma from percent. And that's why you need to choose. Look what happens if you calculate the percent risk. Simply take the margin for error. Margin for error you can calculate in your head. It's the error you're allowed minus the error you've got, your total error, divided by the SD. If you add two to that, you've got a z-score, which is the same thing as a sigma, or it used to be. You can go to the website and you can say for a given z-value or sigma, you can calculate the percent risk, or it's about 1 in 741. So a three-sigma method, if that's a short-term sigma, is one in about 0.1 percent. If you wanted to say I want to set an acceptable risk level of five percent then you'd say my acceptable sigma is 1.65. If you want to say I want 0.1 percent error rate as you can achieve for those glucose you'd set your acceptable sigma level at 3.1. There is an assumed shift in sigma, in six sigma, that they automatically adjust by 1.5 sigma to, rec to recognize the tendency of processes to shift over the long term. The 1.5 sigma shift may or may not be an accurate estimate of the actual long term instability of your process. This is from morestream.com. Here's another sigma explanation. Six sigma actually translates to about two defects per billion and 3.4 defects per million that you normally think of as six sigma is really a sigma value of 4.5. Where does the 1.5 sigma difference come from? Motorola, back in the 80s. I cannot see any reason to expect that viral load technology, immunochemistry, you know, all of the things we do, the ELISA methods, etc., have the same z-value difference as Motorola in the 1980s. And again, at this site, they say given adequate process data, you can determine the factor most appropriate for your process can't resist an opportunity to either share the confusion with you or at least show you that there really is confusion concerning sigma, six sigma, z-scores, and sigma metrics. This is a z-score calculator. This is the same as the sigma value in as much as sigma is the number of standard deviations between the mean and the total allowable error limit.
You can come in here, calculate, put in a Z value, and calculate the percent risk. So 1.65, as we've said, equates to a 5% risk level. If your sigma value is 3, that's only a 0.135% level. Here, on a Z value table, however, come to a Six Sigma table and things are completely different. This is a sigma conversion table. The 1.5 SD shift may or may not be an accurate estimate of your process. Come here to a sigma of 3. It tells you that there's a 6.7% risk rate. 66,000 out of a million is 6.7% risk. So here, with a z-value of 3, it's 0.1%, but on the 6 sigma scale, it's 6.7. Thank you, Dr. Westgard, for all the tools you provide us, but it shows the same thing about sigma. If you have 5 defects out of 100 and calculate the sigma value, it tells you your sigma metric is 3.2. But a 5% error rate typically goes with a 1.65% sigma. If you come down here, enter your quality requirement, your allowable error limit is 10. If you have an observed bias of 6, an observed SD of 2, 6 plus 2 times 2 is 10, your total error equals your total allowable error, but your sigma metric is still 2. With a sigma metric of 2, according to this table, that's a 31% error rate. But we're not sure what's a long-term sigma, what's a short-term sigma, and does this shift apply to what we're doing, or is it something that belongs in industry, or is it something that should be that 1.5S shift, should it be qualified to be specific for the method that you're using, or should we just measure sigma on a regular basis?